This is Leonard Peikoff speaking in the fall of 1990. The following lecture is part of a course originally given in 1976 with Ayn Rand's endorsement and in her presence. As of 1991, however, the course will be superseded by my book, Objectivism, The Philosophy of Ayn Rand. My book recapitulates the 1976 course, but its formulations and logical structure are immeasurably superior. Despite this fact, I am making the original course available for purchase for several reasons. Students may find it profitable to compare the course to the book and discover for themselves the differences. Also, the 1976 course is the only recorded statement of the entire content of objectivism. My new taped course on objectivism is selective, taking for granted a knowledge of the philosophy. Finally, Ayn Rand herself took part in most of the question periods in 1976, and I do not want her recorded comments to disappear from the objectivist scene. To all of you now about to hear this lecture, however, let me stress at the outset that I myself, speaking some 15 years later, regard my new book and not this course as the definitive statement of objectivism. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Our subject this evening and next time, as we continue our discussion of objectivist epistemology, is the nature of concepts and their role in human knowledge. Before we turn to this, however, I want to take up one final point in regard to the senses, an ancient philosophical problem that I mentioned last time and postponed to this evening. Since conceptual knowledge is based, as we said last time, on sensory data, let's make sure before we start on concepts that we have covered the main points in regard to the validity of the senses. And the one main point we have not yet covered is the question that you can call the metaphysical status of sensory qualities. Let me explain. Human consciousness, as we said last time, perceives in a specific form, a form determined by the sensory apparatus of the perceiver. Now, this fact has for centuries led to the question, what then is the status of qualities such as color, sound, and so on? To take redness as the standard example, if redness is man's form of perceiving a certain object, if redness is a function of man's senses, can you then say, people ask, that redness is real? Is it out there, in the world, in things in themselves apart from man? Or is redness only in here, in the mind, in consciousness apart from existence? And if the latter, many philosophers conclude, then the senses are deceivers because the world of colored, sounding, and so on objects that we're given isn't anything like the true reality. So where, as it is commonly put, is red, taking that throughout as the example? Now the first thing I want to point out is that the question in this form is invalid. A sensation is the product of an interaction, a physical interaction between two entities, the physical object and the sense organ of the perceiver, the eye, the ear, etc. Each of these entities is essential. Without the physical object, there's nothing to perceive. Without the sense organs, there is no means of perception. You cannot therefore ask where is red, or more broadly, where is the form of perception? The form is the mind's way of grasping the object. It is the way we perceive the object, given our senses. As such, the form cannot be located in the object apart from the senses, or in the senses apart from the object. It pertains to an interrelation of the two. 
When you use your senses, for instance, see a red object, you are perceiving reality. You're perceiving reality as it is. There is no other reality to perceive. But, if you recall last week's discussion, you are perceiving reality by some means and therefore in some form. Now you might say to me, well, but look, after all, reality is something. It has an identity independent of man. And so you might ask, can we ever know the attributes that objects possess apart from us? In other words, apart from our means or form of perception. And the answer is, in principle, yes. We can know it, but only by starting from sensory data and rising to the conceptual level, the level on which we can think, analyze, identify what aspects of the world that we observe pertain to our forms of perception and what aspects pertain to what we can call in this context metaphysical reality. In other words, reality apart from our form of perception. We can, as I say, make this discovery, but it is not, and I stress this point, it is not the task of philosophy to do so, but of science. Philosophy has no special method to discover the ultimate attributes of matter. That is the province of physics. And the most important point here is, it makes no philosophic difference whatever what the ultimate answer on this issue is. Now, I want to pursue this for a moment. Let's suppose that by scientific means, we reach the stage one day of discovering the ultimate ingredients of the universe. The irreducible primaries which make up reality itself, quite apart from any relation to our form of perception. We discover the basic building blocks which give rise to everything that we perceive, to the entire physical world as we know it. Now what these ultimate primaries are, I do not pretend to know. But let's call them, as I have in past courses, puffs of meta-energy. I deliberately choose an undefined term without pretending to know what it means. Let's assume in sum that we have discovered that things in themselves, to use that expression, are puffs of meta-energy, and that what we perceive as a material world of three-dimensional objects with color, shape, size, and so on, is all an effect on us of these puffs acting on our means of perception. <clears throat> what would this prove about the validity of the senses or the status of sensory qualities? The answer is nothing. Nothing of any epistemological significance whatever. The crucial point here is this. If everything is made of energy puffs in various combinations, so are human beings, including human sense organs. And it is still an iron fact of reality that when the puffs which comprise external reality interact with the puffs which comprise human beings, when all these puffs enter into all the combinations that they do in, enter into, the inexorable result is the material world as we perceive it, with all the kinds of entities and qualities it possesses. This is a fact, a fact of reality, not a creation of consciousness. It is a fact that when such and such energy puffs unite in such and such a combination with other ones, the result is a man with all his properties, or an orange, or a giraffe, or a planet, or a feather, etc. So when we perceive one of these material objects, we are perceiving reality. In other words, energy puffs in a certain combination. And every sense perception gives us real information about that particular combination of puffs. Does it mean that color and the rest are unreal because they are an effect of the puffs in certain combinations? 
the exact opposite is true. If redness is an effect of the puffs, by that very fact, it and all such sensory qualities are real, real products of the real puffs which make up reality. We did not invent the puffs. We did not invent their capacity to unite into forms which bring about a material world. We did not create the physical world by any subjective act of our consciousness. It is a metaphysical fact of reality that X puffs combined with Y puffs combined with Z puffs, Z being man's senses, let us say, and remember that man's senses are part of reality. It's a fact of things in themselves that this combination yields solid three-dimensional objects with all the properties we perceive. And this is a fact we would have to know if we wanted to know the full nature of reality. Suppose somehow, by revelation, we could have been given the puffs directly. We would still have to learn that among the attributes they possess is the fact that in various combinations they produce a material world with the attributes of color, sound, etc. The point here is that you do not deny the reality of something by explaining it. You do not make the material world with its various properties subjective by giving a causal explanation of it. You do not detach it from reality by showing that something in reality produced it. On the contrary, if you have shown that reality itself produced certain facts, then you have given the most solid metaphysical foundation to those facts. You have shown that they are inherent in metaphysical reality itself. To sum up, the whole construct that I gave you would change nothing in regard to the senses or to the metaphysical status of sensory qualities. In the sense I have just indicated, all the sensory qualities we perceive are inherent in reality. They are real, not deceptions or inventions. Now for a fuller treatment of this issue, including a contrast between the objectivist view and the position that is known in the history of philosophy as naive realism, I refer you to lecture 12 Another course of mine on the founders of Western philosophy, the better part of that lecture is devoted to this subject and allied aspects of the objectivist position on the senses. But I have now said as far as this course is concerned as much as I am going to on the validity of the senses. And now let us turn to our main subject, concepts. Human knowledge is conceptual knowledge. Sensory percepts for man are not yet knowledge. They are only the material of knowledge, the basic source of information, which we cannot deal with or act on until we have conceptualized it. The conceptual level of consciousness derives from and is built on the perceptual level but it represents a whole new scale of consciousness. The ability, for instance, to know not only the comparatively few men that you happen to observe in your lifetime, but facts about all men. The ability to grasp causal connections, subsuming countless instances, most of which we will never be able to perceive. The ability to predict the future, discover the remote past, gain knowledge of the outer reaches of space and the inner structure of the atom. All of this and much more is inaccessible to the purely perceptual level, but becomes accessible through concepts. To understand man, to understand the human form of knowledge, and therefore to understand any philosophic issue, ultimately, you must understand concepts. What are concepts? How are they formed? And since the conceptual faculty is volitional, since we must guide its operation by choice, 
what principles must we follow if we are to use this faculty properly? And what cognitive disasters will result if we ignore or violate these principles? Now this is the field and the questions we must now start answering. And first, let us take an overview of the essence of a conceptual consciousness, of the basic difference between the way a conceptual consciousness regards the objects around it and the way a purely perceptual consciousness does. And this leads us to Ayn Rand's discussion of the child's progression from entity to identity to unit from entity to identity to unit. When we reach the perceptual level, as we saw, we directly perceive things, entities. At this stage, we do not yet know what the things are. And at the beginning, at least, we may not even recognize when we see the same thing on different occasions that it is something we've seen before. We may not yet have distinguished a particular thing from all the other things in our awareness. We're merely aware of things. This represents the stage where we have the implicit concept entity. Implicit because no explicit concepts exist at this point. But we do have all of the information required for us subsequently to form the concept entity explicitly. A second stage, which is distinguishable from this first one, occurs when, while we're still on the perceptual level, we are aware not just of entity, but of this one as distinguished from that one where we can recognize particular entities, so that if we see the same thing on successive occasions, we can be aware that it is the same thing we've encountered before. Now we grasp this specific thing versus all the others. This represents the implicit concept identity. Not just a thing, but a particular thing. This thing rather than that. Now, so far, higher animals have equivalent stages of awareness. They have no concepts, of course, not even implicit concepts. But they, too, can perceive entities. And they, too, can learn to distinguish particular entities from others and recognize them on later occasions. Now we reach the stage where we leave the animals behind. Because once we, as human beings, grasp the identities of particular things, we can go on to a next step. We can grasp the relationships among these identities. I'll say it again. We can grasp the relationships among these identities. We can grasp that certain objects are similar to each other and different from everything else. And we can decide to grasp, to group the similar ones together mentally and call them by the same word. For instance, table, chair, etc. From this point on, we no longer view objects as animals do, as unrelated to each other. Now we classify things in terms of similarities and differences of their identities. And we view things as members of groups of similar things. At this stage, when I consider this entity sitting in the front row, I grasp not just entity and not just this particular entity versus that one, but this man. In other words, this in relation to all of the others like him. This 
entity as one of a whole set of similar things. The implicit concept which names this stage is unit. A unit, quoting Ayn Rand's definition, a unit is an existent regarded as a separate member of a group of two or more similar members. An existent regarded as a separate member of a group of two or more similar members. Man's ability to regard entities as units, according to Ms. Rand, is the essence of the conceptual method. That is what distinguishes human cognition from the animals. An animal, you see, is unable to break up its perceptual field. The entities it observes are all mixed together, and it perceives and reacts passively to them in whatever order they happen to strike its consciousness. It has no capacity to organize, to bring order into its percepts. The essence of man's cognitive ability is he can organize perceptual data according to a pattern. He can break up the perceptual chaos. He can decide to put various concretes into a group even though these concretes are not, in fact, all spatially segregated together in reality. Even though, for instance, people and tables and pussycats and automobiles are all jumbled together in reality. We can say, in effect, the similarities among people are so great. Their differences from pussycats and the rest are so striking that we are hereafter going to put all the people together and treat them cognitively as one group. We will continue to regard each person as an entity, of course, but not just an isolated, unrelated entity, as an entity which is a member of a group of similar members, in other words, as a unit. And the result is a whole new scale of cognitive ability. Given this unit perspective, we can pursue knowledge purposefully. We can say, today I'm going to study man and set aside as irrelevant any random percepts which don't apply. In other words, we can sort out our perceptual field and concentrate on specified aspects at a time. And since we treat all men as units under a single concept, we can apply to all of them the knowledge that we gain by studying a comparative handful. We achieve an immense expansion of knowledge by our specific way of viewing entities, by viewing them not as isolated or unrelated, but as members of a group of similar entities, as units. Now, this involves a special human perspective on things, a special way of viewing things. I mean, to view them as units does. Out there in the world, apart from us, there are existence, separate individual things. That is the metaphysical fact. But to regard a thing as a member of a class, to view it as one of a set, to regard it as a unit, this is an epistemological phenomenon, a special and uniquely human mode of regarding existence, a mode of viewing them in certain relationships to each other. This perspective, of course, is not arbitrary. It's based on observed facts, but it is facts as organized and classified by a human method. Now, I'd like you to note, in passing, a very suggestive fact. Without the implicit concept of unit, as I've just been stressing, we could not reach the distinctively conceptual method of knowledge. And without the grasp of the concept unit in some form, 
there is another thing that we could not reach. We could not count, measure, identify quantitative relationships. In short, we could not enter the field of mathematics. In other words, the same concept unit is the base and start of two fields, concepts and mathematics. Now, does that suggest some essential connection between the two fields? Well, of course, if you have done your homework, you know the answer to that. If not, I will indicate shortly. Now, before we pursue that, let's turn to the question, <clears throat> what processes must we perform to be able to regard entities as units? In other words, what are the processes involved in concept formation? In general, there are two main processes involved, which I've already implied. The two processes which are essential to consciousness on the perceptual level also taking apart and putting together, separation and combination, differentiation and integration. All of these are, in essence, synonyms for the present context. By differentiation, we mean broadly the process of grasping differences, of distinguishing, isolating, one or more objects of awareness from the others. By integration, I mean broadly the process of combining or uniting elements into a single whole. Now we begin by isolating a group of concretes from the total confronting us. By saying, in effect, these concretes, such and such and such, belong together and are distinct from all the rest. And this we do, as we've seen, on the basis of similarities. Similarities which we observe, uniting a given group and distinguishing them from all the others. Now these similarities, I'm speaking of the ones that make possible our first differentiations and groupings, are grasped simply by observation, by direct perception. We do not require any concepts to grasp these basic similarities. We merely observe the perceptual world around us. And to this extent, animals and man are in the same boat. <clears throat> Both can directly perceive such similarities among objects. Where then is the distinctively human element in the process? It is the ability to abstract, which involves the ability to focus selectively, to take out the similar aspects and consider them separately, regardless of the differences in which they are embedded in reality. The ability, for instance, to focus on the similar shape of a group of objects, such as tables, and set aside for the moment the differences in size, color, weight, and so on, with which those similarities are connected in reality and then to be able to go on cognitively and do something with the similarities that we observe. That is the point where we leave the animals. The animal perceives the whole object. He perceives similarities and differences. But he cannot consider the similarities separately and go on to do anything with them. He can't isolate or unite any group of concretes according to them, and therefore he gets no further cognitively. Now what is it that we as against the animals go on to do with the similar concretes once we've isolated them? Observe that so far as I have described the process, we don't yet have a concept, merely an isolated perceptual group. If we did nothing further, we could not keep the group mentally isolated. To do that, we must form a concept, which requires that we now integrate, put all the relevant concretes together. 
integrating percepts in this connection means the process of actually blending all the percepts, for instance, all the ones of tables, into a single whole, so that after the integration, you have, in effect, a new entity, a mental entity, which functions as a single unit. What does this entity, for instance, the concept table, what does this mental entity stand for and include? An unlimited number of concretes. All the appropriate ones in the past, all the tables in the present, all the ones yet to come in the future. When you form a concept, it includes every concrete with the appropriate attributes. It is as Ayn Rand said, like an arithmetical sequence, open at both ends, going in both directions, past and future. The concept condenses into one unit every concrete which fulfills the appropriate requirements. Now, how is such an integration into one unit possible? In what form can one hold such a sum of concretes before the mind? The answer explains the role of words in concept formation. If we did not have words, if we had performed all the processes I mentioned so far, but there were no language, what we would have before our minds would be a number of concretes and a resolve to treat them and everything like them together. But there would be no unit which you could retain. Every time you'd want to use your concept, you would have to summon a number of concretes and reform the abstraction, and then it would dissipate again. A word, however, changes all this. A word is a symbol which stands for a concept. A word is a concrete, perceptually graspable symbol. When it becomes the symbol for a concept, what it does is transform the sum of concretes and the resolve to unite them into a single mentally graspable unit. You see, only concretes exist, and only concretes are graspable or dealable with by the mind. So if the concept is to be graspable and retainable, it must exist as something concrete, mental to be sure, but still concrete or definite. It has to be a something. And this is the function of language. Language, as Ms. Rand has observed, is a code of visual auditory symbols that serves the function of converting concepts into the mental equivalent of concretes. Therefore, it is not true that words are required primarily for communication. Words are indispensable to the process of conceptualization itself and thus to thought as such. The word is the form in which the concept exists. And the process of forming a concept, the integration, is not complete until a word has been selected. Well, having said all this, are we finished with the processes of concept formation? No. <clears throat> so far, I've given only a very general description of the process. Now we have to answer some more specific and trickier questions. The big philosophic issue in this field is the question what is the relation of concepts to concrete existence? Or put another way, to what exactly do concepts refer in reality? Now, there's no such problem in regard to percepts. A percept is a direct awareness of a concrete existing entity. But a concept is not. A concept involves an abstraction, and there are no abstractions out there in reality, only concretes. So what does it refer to, then, 
people ask. What does the concept refer to? Well, you probably would answer the concept refers to something that all of the concretes in a given group possess in common. You might say madness, for instance, is something present in all men, and that's what the concept refers to. But if you left it just at that and went out into a philosophy department, you would find skeptics descend on you instantly and say, I can't find any madness. They'll bring out their binoculars and tell you, I could only find particular men, and each is different from the rest. And of course, this is true so far as perceptual awareness goes. There may be nothing on the perceptual level that we can find that is literally the same among the concretes of a given concept. Men, for instance, vary in every respect you can name their height, their weight, their fingerprints, their intelligence, etc. In other words, on the perceptual level, we observe similarities, but we may find nothing identical, nothing the same among the similar concretes. So where or what, then, is madness? Is it just, as one school says, an arbitrary name for rough similarity? Or is there really something the same among the concretes in a given group, and if so, what? We can put the problem this way. When we reach the concept, we treat all the concretes under it as equally members of the group. We treat all the instances as, in some respect, the same. That's inherent in integrating into a single unit to stand for all. But how can this be? By what means are we able to treat as one unit, as the same, a set of concretes which, as far as perception goes, may have nothing identical about them? Now, you see, similarity is a different concept from sameness or being identical. We can perceive similarities without perceiving anything literally the same. Well, then you would ask, what is similarity? When two things are similar, surely you will say they can't be completely different. So in some way, in some respect, they must be the same. But how? In what way? Now, I assume you see the kinds of questions that we have not yet answered. And so long as we haven't, we have not properly understood or objectively validated concepts. We haven't established their relation to reality. And therefore, we would have left a gaping hole in epistemology. And we would have left any conceptual conclusion we ever come to vulnerable. We would leave ourselves wide open, for instance, to the kind of people who hear an argument and say, oh, well, that's an abstraction. Come down to Earth. The implication being abstractions, of course, have no connection to Earth or reality. They're divorced from reality. Or the kind of people who hear an argument and say, that's just semantics, that's just how you use words, which implies that the use of words, in other words, of concepts, is arbitrary. Reality has nothing to say about concepts on that view. So you'll see the, if I can use the expression, cash value of solving this problem. Now, what is the objectivist answer? Its essence lies in Miss Rand's revolutionary discovery, which I've already alluded to, that there is a fundamental connection between concept formation and mathematics. Her discovery that concept formation is essentially a mathematical process. And that's what I want now to develop. Mathematics is the science of measurement. The process of measurement, Ms. Rand observed, is essential to the formation of concepts. So let's begin with a few remarks on the nature of measurement and then apply our discussion to concept formation. What is measurement? It is a method of establishing relationships between concretes. 
quantitative relationships. When you measure, there must be something that you measure by means of its attributes. For example, you measure a thing's length or weight or volume or whatever. And there must be some standard of measurement, some easily perceivable concrete to serve as a unit in terms of which you can perform the process. For instance, you might measure a length in units of feet or a weight in units of a pound, etc. The unit, of course, must be appropriate to the attribute being measured. You can't measure length in pounds or weight in seconds, etc. What makes a unit appropriate? The fact that it itself is a concrete instance of the attribute in question. A foot, for instance, is itself a length, a particular concretely specified amount of length. So it can serve as a unit to measure a length. And the same applies to every type of measure. When we measure in sum, we establish the relationship of any instance of a given attribute to some specific instance of it, which we have selected as the unit of measurement for that attribute. I'll repeat. When we measure, we establish the relationship of any instance of an attribute. That's the one we're measuring, any instance. We establish its relationship to some specific instance, which we have selected as the unit of measurement. And thus, Ms. Rand's definition of measurement, quote, measurement is the identification of a relationship, a quantitative relationship established by means of a standard that serves as a unit, unquote. In the broadest sense, then, measurement is a process of establishing relationships. Now, what is the purpose of measurement? What do we accomplish by establishing such relationships? Well, consider. <clears throat> I tell you that the moon is 240,000 miles from Earth, and you have no trouble grasping my statement. Now, we cannot possibly perceive, perceive, a distance that size. Yet we can grasp and deal with it. How? By establishing its relationship to distances that we can directly perceive. We can't perceive 240,000 miles, but that is so many miles, and a mile is so many feet, and a foot is this. And it works in the other direction on the micro levels as well. A certain reaction took place, a scientist says, in 4.6 milliseconds. Now, a millisecond, a thousandth of a second, is too small to be within the range of our consciousness. Yet by relating it as a fraction to a time we can perceive directly, such as a second, we can grasp it and deal with it. In all cases, what measurement permits us to do is to grasp and deal with cognitively aspects of reality that are inaccessible to the perceptual level of our consciousness. Our cognitive range is enormously expanded. By the device of taking some quantity, we can directly and easily perceive, and then relating it to smaller and larger quantities which themselves are unperceivable by us and which would otherwise be ungraspable and incomprehensible to us. I quote from Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology, quote, the process of measurement is a process of integrating an unlimited scale of knowledge to man's limited perceptual experience a process of making the universe knowable by bringing it within the range of man's consciousness, 
by establishing its relationship to man." Unquote. In this respect, measurement is an anthropocentric process. I mean, a process in which man is at the center. His scale of perception, the concrete he can directly grasp, is the standard. And the process consists of bringing everything else into relation to man, to what man can directly perceive. Now we're on the threshold of the momentous point in regard to concepts. The fundamental connection between measurement and conceptualization. The two processes, Ayn Rand observes, have the same essential purpose and follow the same essential method. The two processes, conceptualization and measurement, have the same essential purpose and follow the same essential method. In both cases, the essence is to establish relationships among concretes. In both cases, you establish relationships to directly perceived concretes. In other words, man's range of direct awareness is the base. And by relating everything else to it, you achieve an enormously expanded, otherwise impossible scale of knowledge. And in both cases, we relate concretes quantitatively, by quantitative means. In concept formation, as in measurement, the discovery of a certain kind of quantitative relation is the crucial tie. Ayn Rand's observation is that the concretes of a given concept differ from one another only quantitatively, only in the measurements of their characteristics. So when we form a concept, our mental process consists of retaining the characteristics of the concretes, but omitting their varying measurements. To repeat, when we form a concept, our mental process consists of retaining the characteristics of the concretes, but omitting their varying measurements. Consider as a simple example Ms. Rand's analysis of forming the concept leg. We perceive a match, a pencil, a stick. We perceive a certain similarity among these objects, extension. We selectively attend to this aspect and consider it separately. We integrate into a single mental unit, choose a word, and we have a concept. Now what went on? Our minds discovered a certain connection among these concretes. What kind? It discovered that they could all be related quantitatively to the same kind of unit of measurement. Or in other words, that we are here dealing with the same attribute in each case. And that what differs in the three cases is only the quantity of the attribute. The pencil is longer than the match, say, and shorter than the stick. The three lengths have different measurements. They are identical in attribute. The difference is one of measurement. What then did our mind have to do to be able to integrate the three into one mental unit? It had to retain the attribute and omit from attention the varying measurements. In reality, of course, specific lengths always have some specific quantity. But the point is that length, the attribute, may exist in any quantity. And what we do to form such a concept, therefore, is to retain the attribute apart from the measurement of its quantity in any particular case. To quote again from Ms. Rand, quote, length must exist in some quantity, but may exist in any quantity. 
I should say she's here naming the principle behind the process of measurement omission. Quote, length must exist in some quantity, but may exist in any quantity. I shall identify as length that attribute of any existent possessing it, which can be quantitatively related to a unit of length without specifying the quantity, unquote. The general principle is all the concretes of a given concept can be quantitatively related to the same unit of measurement. In other words, they can be measured by reference to the same standard of measurement. And all that differs in the various cases is the particular measurement. That is why, having formed a concept, you're able to apply it to a new concrete that comes under it. You can do so because you grasp that the new concrete also can be related quantitatively to the same kind of unit, and that all that differs is the amount, the specific measure. By this means, the mind is enabled to treat a endless group of concretes together. It can treat them as the same in a specified respect. It simply refrains from specifying any particular measurement. It retains the characteristic. It omits the measurements. Now you can understand the objectivist answer to what is similarity. When two things are similar, we said, they must somehow be the same, but how? And objectivism answers, when two things are similar, what is the same is the characteristics they possess. What differs is the measurements or degree of these characteristics in particular instances. And thus, Ms. Rand's definition of similarity in the present context, quote, the relationship between two or more existence, which possess the same characteristic or characteristics, but in different measure or degree. Unquote. You can now see easily enough what the process of abstraction consists of at root. Abstraction, we said, involves a process of selective attention. Well, now we can say what that precisely consists of. The essence of abstraction is measurement omission. Retaining the attributes not specifying the measurements in any particular case. Now, a quick side note here. Abstraction is not evasion or fantasy. You must always remember that measurements exist in reality, that every concrete has specific measurements. Measurement omission means simply we don't specify the measurements and thereby we form an integration equally applicable to all the relevant concretes. Conceptualization, in sum, is a method of retaining and being aware of an endless number of concretes in one mental frame by the device of omitting their measurements. The concept is the identification of the concretes with their measurements omitted. Now let me mention one more example, and again I'm going to follow Ms. Rand and take the example of a table. It's the example of a concept of an entity. And this is the same essential process as forming the concept length, only more complex to explain because we have an entity involved here, and therefore we have to omit the measurements of a great number of attributes. What measurements would be omitted in this case? Everything which is an adult, you would have to measure about a specific table in order to be able to reproduce it exactly. All such measurements are not specified in forming the concept of table. For instance, and I'm certainly not going to give you all the characteristics, but for instance, the specific shape of the surface. Is it round, square, triangular, etc.? This is geometrically measurable. The size of the surface. The specific color which is a measurable in, uh, attribute, as Ms. Rand points out in her discussion. The specific weight, the number of legs, their position in relation to the surface, which is measurable, the length of the legs, etc., etc. 
The concept table stands for and includes all tables, past, present, future. How can it do so? Because when we form it, we retain all the above characteristics with their specific measurements in any particular table not specified. And the result is a mental unit covering, applying to, subsuming every object with a flat surface and supports. In other words, every table regardless of its measure. Now let me give you the formal definition of a concept. Every aspect of it should now be clear. Quote from Ms. Rent, a concept is a mental integration of two or more units possessing the same distinguishing characteristic or characteristics with their particular measurements omitted, unquote. Now, you see, you could not have a more magnificent summary of the whole thing, because every idea we have discussed tonight, unit, differentiation or distinguishing, integration, measurement omission, all of it condensed into one definition. Now, I've been able to give you only a few examples tonight, just enough to illustrate the pattern. In Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology, however, Ms. Rand goes systematically through all the main kinds of concepts, demonstrating in each case how the principle of measurement omission applies. I refer you to the book for this material, including, among many other things, a discussion of the concept of actions, concepts of relations, of materials, all the various parts of speech. I'd like also to call your attention to the fact that there are other aspects of the mathematical nature of concept formation beside the points I've so far mentioned. I want to mention just one more such aspect, just a brief mention, and again refer you to the book for, for a fuller treatment. I have in mind the role of measurement in the process of differentiation. We said that in forming a concept, we begin by differentiating a group of concretes from others. Now, Ms. Rand observes that this process cannot be done arbitrarily. For instance, you can form a concept by differentiating tables from, say, chairs. But you cannot if you try to differentiate tables from, say, red objects. Why not? because there is no basis to relate the latter two kinds of concretes in our minds. There's no basis to bring tables and red objects together to compare or contrast them. The point is, when you conceptualize, the necessary relationships are established quantitatively in terms of measurements. And there is no form of measurement which applies to red and table. One is a color. One is an entity with a certain type of shape. And shape and color are incommensurable. They are not subject to the same unit of measurement. And therefore, the mind can do nothing with them in this form. And Ms. Rand proceeds to develop the concept of the conceptual common denominator, which you can call for notes the CCD for short. In other words, that characteristic which is reducible to a unit of measurement, which is possessed both by the group being conceptualized and the group from which you are distinguishing it and by means of which you make the differentiation. You can get that definition from the book. Now, I've given just a brief mention, as you see, to the CCD. But here you see from another aspect, concept formation is mathematical in both parts. In regard to differentiation, you can do it only in terms of a commensurable attribute. And that determines what you must choose as a distinguishing characteristic of the concept. And in regard to integration, you can only integrate concretes whose differences are differences of measurement. Notice, therefore, for future reference, 
no part of the concept forming process is arbitrary or subject to whim. It must be done throughout on the basis of facts of reality, in accordance with mathematical relationships. Now, I'd like you to note that when we talk about measurement omission, we are speaking about the underlying mechanics of the process of concept formation. In other words, about the process that is performed for us by the very nature of our conceptual faculty. To form a concept, a person does not have to perform measurements consciously or even know how to go about performing them. On the conscious level, all a man has to do is perceive similarities, abstract, decide to designate the group by a word, and he has a concept. In order for him to carry on these conscious processes, his conceptual faculty had to grasp the appropriate mathematical relationships involved. It had to go through what we describe as measurement omission. But you, on the conscious level, need have no idea that that's what's going on. Now you might ask me, well, what then is the practical purpose of knowing this theory? If your mind goes through the necessary steps by its nature without your knowledge. Part of the answer is you have to know what concepts are, including the theory of measurement omission, in order to discover the rules to guide the parts of the process which are not automatic, which are volitional. And that you'll see later tonight and even more fully next week. If you did not know fully what a concept was and how it was formed, we could not prescribe how to perform the aspects of the process which are in our conscious volitional control. Even more basically, the theory of measurement omission is essential to the validation of conceptual knowledge as such. So long as we do not know the nature of concepts, we are open to all the kinds of questions and doubts I indicated earlier, centering around the issue, how are concepts related to concretes? The answer to this is what the theory of measurement omission supplies. Concepts, according to objectivism, are based on and do refer to facts of reality. A concept refers to the fact that its various concretes possess the same distinguishing characteristics and that the differences are differences only of measurement. A concept, for instance, manness, is therefore not a product of arbitrary choice. It is not a personal or social convention. It has a real factual basis. But the basis is not some mystical blob or secret ingredient hiding out in men. If we use the example of manness, we could say manness is men, the real concrete men who exist with all their attributes. It is men viewed selectively. It is a unit to stand for all of them interchangeably by the device of omitting their varying measurements. It is an integration based on facts as processed by man's mind. Now before the break, I want to quote the brilliant conclusion of chapter two of Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology for the final touch in regard to the relation of concepts to concretes, Ms. Rand's analogy or comparison between concept formation and algebra. Quote, the basic principle of concept formation, which states that the omitted measurements must exist in some quantity, but may exist in any quantity is the equivalent of the basic principle of algebra, which states that algebraic symbols must be given some numerical value, but may be given any value. In this sense and respect, perceptual awareness is the arithmetic 
but conceptual awareness is the algebra of cognition. The relationship, I'm continuing the quote, the relationship of concepts to their constituent particulars is the same as the relationship of algebraic symbols to numbers. In the equation, 2a equals a plus a. Any number may be substituted for the symbol a without affecting the truth of the equation. For instance, 2 times 5 equals 5 plus 5. Or 2 times 5 million equals 5 million plus 5 million. In the same manner, by the same psychoepistemological method, a concept is used as an algebraic symbol that stands for any of the arithmetical sequence of units it subsumes. Let those who attempt to invalidate concepts by declaring that they cannot find madness in men, try to invalidate algebra by declaring that they cannot find anus in five or in five million." Unquote. Now, those of you who know the traditional approaches to concepts in the history of philosophy will understand the enormous contrast between the objectivist view and all the earlier theories. We're going to refer to this contrast next week, and you will see then that and how Ayn Rand's approach provides for the first time in the history of philosophy an objective validation of human concepts. And as such, it is an essential element in Ayn Rand's most crucial epistemological achievement, the validation once and for all of man's method of cognition i.e. of reason. Now let's take our break. <clears throat>
and thus are able to differentiate, uh, excuse me, to conceptualize them. And let us take a single example tonight, the concept of thinking or thought. How would one in pattern form such a concept? Now, we must assume that you've reached a comparatively advanced stage of development. You've acquired a complex vocabulary of existential concepts, which enables you to perform the activity of thinking. And now say you're ready to conceptualize the activity. Well, first you would have to isolate a number of instances of thinking from other mental processes you perform, such as perceiving, feeling, and so on. Which means you would have to grasp similarities and differences in your mental actions. Similarities uniting various instances of thinking and differentiating them from other conscious processes. And this, of course, requires introspection on your part. All concepts of consciousness require introspection. Introspection is the process of looking inward, of directing one's cognitive focus and attention to one's own consciousness. Schematically, for instance, on this example, let's say a child is given a problem in arithmetic to solve in school, and he goes through a certain mental process. He asks himself questions, and each answer leads him to another question, another step, and he keeps focusing purposefully in order to get the final solution. He's thinking. Now, so far he is performing the process, but he has not yet formed the concept of thinking. But now suppose he goes home to play, and a problem comes up about repairing his wagon. And again, he asks and answers a series of purposeful questions in pursuit of the solution. And again and again on different instances. In each case, the content varies, but there is a certain similarity, a purposeful step-by-step -step pursuit of knowledge. Now, this is the kind of similarity he'd have to grasp, a purposeful process of cognition. Uh, what would he be isolating each of the instances from? Any other mental process that he observes from which they differ in character. For instance, during one thought process he may have felt dismay. Um, after another excitement, in another, nothing in particular. But he had to grasp that the thinking processes all had something in common that differentiated them from the feeling or other processes that sometimes accompany. All right, say the child has isolated several instances of thinking. He hasn't yet formed a concept. These instances are the units of what will be his concept, but they differ among themselves in various ways. And he must abstract away from these differences in order to perform the final integration. Here is where measurement omission comes in. What are the measurements of a thought process? two aspects. One pertains to the content, the other to the intensity, the intensity of the action. Consider each for a moment. In forming the concept of thought, one measurement you omit is the content of any particular thought process. A process is thought regardless of its content, whether it's on a problem in arithmetic or about wagons, or whatever. The content is a variable from instance to instance, and it is not specified in forming the concept. The content is a measurable attribute, because, as we've seen, it's ultimately some aspect of the external world. And as such, it is measurable by the methods of measurement applicable to physical existence. So one type of measurable attribute that you omit in forming concepts of consciousness is the content. The second type, I said, is the intensity of the process. By intensity here, we mean a general term denoting the quantitative degree or amount of the action. In each instance of a conscious state, the process will have some particular degree 
of intensity, some particular extent or measurement. The intensity of a thought process, for instance, is a function of many factors. But well, let's take simply a brief indication. Thoughts vary in their scope, in the amount of material that they take in and encompass, and in the length of the conceptual chain required to deal with such material, in the amount a man had to know in order to engage in the thinking process in question. Some thoughts deal with wide, complex issues where there are a great number of elements to be interrelated. Other thoughts are narrower, less complex, they involve fewer elements, and you have to know less in order to think about the subject in question. Contrast thinking about what outfit to wear tomorrow, for instance, with thinking about the principles of concept formation. In the second case, the dimensions, the size, if you will, of the thought is incomparably greater. The number of elements to be integrated is vastly more. The scope of one process is much greater than of the other. Well, one process, we say, is more intense than the other. Now note that we are talking in approximate, but nevertheless quantitative terms. We are speaking of more or less, of how many elements, of how much you have to know. We are relating two thought processes in terms of quantitative relations. Now there are other aspects involved in the intensity of a thought process, and different kinds of factors involved in the intensity of other kinds of mental processes. So this is merely a taste. But it's enough for you to be able to see that the instances of a mental process vary not only in the measurements of their respective content, but in the degree or measurements of their intensity. Yet the concept we form, for instance, the concept thought, subsumes and includes all these varying instances. What then makes it possible? Our minds omit the varying measurements of both kinds and retain the characteristics which are the same in every unit. The same principles, in other words, apply as applied to forming existential concepts. Now, for a fuller treatment of concepts of consciousness, I refer you to uh, Ms. Rand's book. You'll find a wealth of material, including analyses of concepts of method, of grammar, and of highly complex concepts, which involve integrations of concepts of consciousness with existential concepts, for instance, the concept marriage or property. And you'll find much more still that I can't begin even to touch on here. I want for the record to mention that there are two chapters of the book that I have had to omit entirely because of time considerations. One deals with the formation of axiomatic concepts, that is, the concepts of existence, consciousness, identity. And I suggest you read that. The other covers abstraction from abstractions. Now that I specifically ask you to read. The principles of their formation, that is, we're talking about abstraction from abstractions, the principle of their formation in essence is the same as what we've already discussed although it is more complex. I'm going to have something to say about these higher level concepts next time when we discuss the topic of the hierarchical nature of knowledge and the process of reducing concepts to their perceptual base. So I ask you to read specifically that chapter in preparation for our discussion next time. For now, I want to turn to one final process involved in concept formation a process which is essential at a certain point to virtually every concept, whether of existence or of consciousness, whether first level or higher. And I mean the process of definition. Process of definition. And let's begin 
by observing that no special effort is required to ensure that a sensory perception is of something specific. There is no such thing as an unrealistic or floating sense perception. But when you use a concept, there is no single entity in reality to gaze at. The concept is a product of abstraction and of a complex integration. And there is no automatic mechanism to ensure that we will know what specifically the concept stands for. I refer you to the obvious cases of what we call floating abstractions. That is where an individual uses abstract terms like liberty or love, and there are many others, without knowing what specific units they stand for. In such a case, the individual's alleged concept is not a cognitive device any longer. It is actually a patch of fog consisting of a few random images, some stray examples, feelings, social customs, etc. A valid concept must designate specific units which you have isolated from all others. And this is the basic function of a definition, to ensure that a concept remains tied to reality. The purpose of a definition, I quote Ms. Rand, is to distinguish a concept from all other concepts and thus to keep its units differentiated from all other existence, unquote. Now in the early stages of his development, a child can keep his concepts connected to the, the units by the simple method of so-called ostensive definition which simply means pointing to instances and saying, for instance, by table, I mean this. But at a certain point, that method of ostensive definition will not work. The child begins to acquire too many concepts, and particularly higher level, complex ones, such as justice, culture, etc. In a word, a structure too complex for pointing any longer to be able to keep each of his concepts tied to reality and clearly differentiated from the rest. That is the point where explicit definitions, identifying the nature of a concept's units, are crucial. Now obviously you cannot identify the nature of the units by listing all of their characteristics. If you tried to, you would end up with an unwieldy conglomeration of characteristics much too large for you to retain, and therefore which would not serve to distinguish a set of concretes from the others. No, what you must do is identify the units in terms of essential characteristics. Here's a definition of definition, a statement that identifies the nature of the units subsumed under a concept by means of specifying their essential characteristics. A statement that identifies the nature of the units subsumed under a concept by means of specifying their essential characteristics. What do we mean by essential characteristics? The fundamental characteristics which make the units of a given concept the kind of units they are and differentiate them from all other known existence. By the essential, we mean the fundamental characteristics which make the units the kind of units they are and differentiate them from all other known existence. Now a proper definition by essentials as Aristotle pointed out long ago, must consist of two parts or elements, the differentia and the genus. The differentia, as the name indicates, means those characteristics which differentiate the units in question from all other existence. 
For instance, in regard to man, he is the animal with the rational faculty. So a rational faculty is the differential. The genus covers the characteristics which essentially connect the units of a given concept with other existence by stating to what broader group the units belong. For instance, in relation to man, he is the animal, or, which has the faculty of reason in the traditional definition, so animal would be his genus. Now observe how the genus differential structure of a definition is determined by the basic processes of concept formation. When we form a concept, we isolate its units by means of a distinguishing characteristic. Well, that becomes, in our definition, the differentia. And you recall the point that when we differentiate, we do it on the basis of a common characteristic possessed both by the units we're isolating and the concretes from which we're isolating. In other words, there's always a wider category within which we do our differentiating and to which the units in question belong. And that wider category becomes the genus. So the definition gives us in terse, succinct terms the essence of the concept forming process. It condenses into one economical statement what distinguishes the units and indicates within what wider group the distinction was made. And by that means, it tells us the nature of the units. Now in the chapter on definition, Ms. Rand discusses at length the principles to guide men in selecting and validating a definition. And I want to mention certain points here, not primarily as guidance in regard to formulating specific definitions, but because of their significance in understanding the nature and role of concepts. The first point that I want to stress is that a definition depends on one's context of knowledge. <clears throat> a def definition depends on one's context of knowledge. Now we're going to discuss the contextual nature of knowledge next time. For tonight, I just want to introduce you to the idea in regard to definitions. And the basic idea here is this. No conceptual knowledge can be acquired in a vacuum. At any stage of development, you can come to new conclusions, advance your knowledge only by reference to the knowledge available to you at that stage. You have at each stage a certain context of knowledge. The context is the whole field of your knowledge at that stage. Now this applies to human knowledge in general, as we will discuss next time. But now we're concerned with definitions. Definitions are contextual. Their purpose is to isolate certain units from everything else in a given context of knowledge. At an early stage, when you've made only a few discriminations, a generalized characteristic may serve perfectly to isolate a given set of units from the rest of the things that you know at that point. At a later stage, this same characteristic may no longer serve to differentiate the units from the things you now know. At this stage, the initial definition is no longer valid. It no longer performs its differentiating function. Now you must revise the definition in accordance with your expanded cognitive context. In other words, at each stage, you organize only those facts available to you at that stage. Now, I call to your attention here Ms. Rand's marvelously worked out example of the expansion and development of the definition of man. You recall that child's initial implicit definition of man might be a thing that moves and makes sound. Within his knowledge, not yet having discovered and discriminated various animals, automobiles, etc., 
grasping, let us say at that point, only the distinction between inert, silent objects like tables and chairs versus the people around him, he may select moving and making sounds as the characteristic differentiating men from all other objects that he knows. And at this stage, he does know no other objects which move and make sounds except man. And as such, he has within his knowledge successfully isolated man from the rest of what is known to him. So his definition is correct. It is valid since the standard of a correct definition is its ability to distinguish the existence from the others. Then the child discovers cats, dogs, automobiles. Now he has to revise his definition of man because now he has discovered further entities and his uh, old definition ceases to differentiate man from the things he now knows. In this expanded context, the old definition is no longer valid. Of course, it still names actual characteristics of man. It's still true as a description of man, but that characteristic of moving and making sounds no longer serves as defining. Now the child may define man as living thing that walks on two legs and has no fur. And this is a perfectly valid definition, granted this context of knowledge. And the same pattern and principle applies to all the later stages of expansion and development up to the one which is the one and only valid adult definition within the context of all knowledge to date, namely the rational animal. Now parenthetically, if you ask me, well, when can a person say that he has a definition of a concept that is applicable to all men? The answer is when he can show that the differentia and genus he has selected are the essentials taking into account the full context of knowledge available to mankind at that stage. Now you see from the one example of concept man that the appropriate definition is determined by the context of knowledge at a given stage. Now the fact that definitions are contextual in no way means that they are arbitrary or subjective or up to the caprice or whim of the definer. Given any particular context, the objectively valid definition in that context is entirely determined by the facts of reality. Granted, any specific set of entities which you know and which are to be differentiated from one another it is the actual nature of the entities which dictates what characteristics do differentiate. For instance, on the man example, once the child knows of dogs and cats, he cannot decide to keep his initial definition. Now he must seek out the facts about man which actually differentiates him from dogs and cats. And what these facts are is not open to the child's whim. They are dictated by the actual nature of man, dogs, cats. To put it in a sum summary form, definitions are dictated by the facts of reality in the context of one's knowledge at any given stage. And both aspects of this statement are crucial. Reality and the context of one's knowledge. Existence and consciousness. Now, hold this in mind, and we are going to uh, return to it in a later lecture. Now, before we leave the contextual issue this evening, I'd like you to observe that the fact that definitions may be altered as knowledge progresses in no way means that the new definition contradicts the old definition. Facts identified in the old definition remain facts about the entity. The knowledge of those facts remains knowledge of the entity. All that changes is that in the new expanded context, the former facts no longer serve to differentiate. In other words, they're no longer definition. Every definition contains the implicit parenthesis in the present context of knowledge. And therefore, no definition which is correct at one stage can ever be contradicted 
at a later stage. Again, we will be pursuing this idea further in subsequent lectures. Now there's one further principle of definition which is very important that I want to touch on at least, and that is the issue of fundamentality. Fundamentality. This arises when the units of a concept are observed to have a number of distinctive characteristics, not just a single one. Why do you do that? The answer is you choose the one which most significantly distinguishes the units from the rest. In other words, you choose the fundamental. And by fundamental here, we mean the characteristic responsible for the greatest number of an existence distinctive characteristics characteristic responsible for the greatest number of a thing's distinctive characteristics. And the definitional principle is, the relevant here is, an essential characteristic must be a fundamental. You could not, for instance, define man as an entity with a thumb, even if that were distinctive, because it would not distinguish man significantly. If you took away men's thumbs, there would still be massive differences between men and other creatures that would require conceptualization. When you define by fundamentals, however, thus you define man by rationality, your definition identifies the root of a whole set of distinctive characteristics. It therefore names that which most signally sets man apart from all other objects that which underlies and therefore carries with it countless other characteristics distinctive to man. Now if you want an example of the exact opposite of the principle of fundamentality, the classic example is a certain schizophrenic some of you may have heard of, <coughs> who, this is an actual true example, who equated sex, cigars, and Jesus Christ. He treated these three as members of a single class, as units of the same concept, because all had a certain attribute in common, which they subsequently got him the name, was encirclement. In sex, you see the man encircles the woman as he saw it. The cigar is encircled by the tax band, and Jesus Christ he visualized as encircled by a halo. So he had formed a concept of encirclist, in effect. Now, with a concept such as this, a person would be much better off on the perceptual level. <laughs> because you just imagine studying cigars and applying your conclusions to sex, or Jesus for that matter. Now, why would such a grouping lead to cognitive chaos and to disaster? Because encirclement is not a fundamental. It is not causally significant. It is not responsible for any further consequences. It leads nowhere. It's a dead end. And because of this, the schizophrenic was in an institution and got nowhere by grouping on such a basis. Definition by non-fundamentals, in other words, represents a basic perversion of the use of the conceptual faculty. It amounts to the attempt to unite into a group and treat as a unit a motley array of crucially divergent concretes, such as this schizophrenic attempted. It confounds the basic purpose and essence of conceptualization. And that is why we say definitions must be in terms of fundamentals. Now there's one final point I want to develop this evening. And that pertains to the relationship between a concept and its definition. First, I'll state the point, and then I'll explain. The point is, a concept subsumes and includes all the characteristics of its units. A concept is not exhausted by or interchangeable with its definition. Let me repeat. A concept includes 
all the characteristics of its units. A concept is not exhausted by its definition, is not interchangeable with its definition. <clears throat> now to elaborate. When you have a concept of some existence, of an entity, for instance, man, your concept stands for and designates that entity, including all its characteristics, whether they are distinguishing or not. The concept man, for instance, does not mean just animality plus rationality. It means the entity, including all his characteristics. Remember that the concept man does not denote free-floating attributes. It denotes an entity. And the entity is what it is, A is A. We select a certain characteristic, a distinguishing one, to perform a certain function in connection with our conceptualizing activities. But that doesn't mean that in reality all the other characteristics cease to exist. They don't. They are all still facts. They are still part of the entity. And since the concept is not a fabrication or an evasion, it refers to the facts, to all the characteristics of the entity. If it's true, for instance, that man walks on two legs and has no feathers, the concept includes and refers to these facts also, even though they're not distinctive to man. When we define man as the rational animal, it is not that man now becomes, in effect, anything whatever that has the characteristics of rationality and animality, no matter whether it has two legs or 50 or nine tongues or whatever. The concept man designates everything in fact true of man. Speaking literally, therefore, observe that the concept of man, once formed, does not change. The definition may change in different contexts of knowledge, but whether it's a savage or a child or a sophisticated scientist, they all have the same concept. When each says man, he is referring to and means the same entities with the same characteristics. All that differs is how many characteristics they know and which characteristics in any given context they choose as definition. Now, I think you can see the disasters of the opposite viewpoint, which is the common one today among philosophers, common virtually unchallenged. These people have no idea how concepts are formed and no idea where definitions come from. They simply memorize definitions in a vacuum without any connection to reality, and they treat the concept as though it was simply a shorthand tag for the definition. Man, for this mentality, is just a, a noise we make to save ourselves the trouble of saying the noise is rational animal. It's a, it's a shorthand tag for other words, and that's all. The result is, this mentality does not have concepts of entities, only of floating characteristics. And it has no idea how the definitions that they memorized are arrived at or validated. If you have a concept of an entity, then a study of that entity will indicate the appropriate definition. But if the concept is just a tag for a definition, where did the definition come from? Of course, the answer given today is definitions are arbitrary, linguistic, social, and so on. Now, objectivism rejects this entire approach completely. Now, to continue with and develop this same point, for all of the reasons that a concept is not restricted to the defining characteristics, it is not restricted to the known characteristics. The concept refers to the entity, which is what it is regardless of our knowledge. 
We're not omniscient. We can always learn more about the entity. We can add to our knowledge of its characteristics. Well, when we do, our concept does not change. Our knowledge of the entity grows, but that merely means we learn more about the characteristics that were part of the entity all the time, and therefore were included in the concept from the outset. So when I say man, it means not just a few isolated characteristics, and not just all the characteristics we know now. It means actually a volume, and even an encyclopedia. It means everything, every characteristic which in fact characterizes the entity man in reality, whether known or not at any given time. Always remember here that your concept is not a concept of your knowledge of the entity. It is a concept of the entity. Now this crucial point, Ms. Rand refers to as the open-end nature of concepts. And I want to conclude by quoting one key passage in this regard from Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology. Just a few sentences. Quote, since concepts represent a system of cognitive classification, a given concept serves, speaking metaphorically, as a file folder in which man's mind files his knowledge of the existence it subsumes. The content of such folders varies from individual to individual according to the degree of his knowledge. It ranges from the primitive, generalized information in the mind of a child or an illiterate to the enormously detailed sum in the mind of a scientist. But it pertains to the same reference, to the same kind of existence, and is subsumed under the same concept. This filing system makes possible such activities as learning, education, research, the accumulation, transmission, and expansion of knowledge." Unquote. You see, if a person's concept meant or included only whatever he happened to know at any given stage, then the tie between concepts and existence would have been cut, and a concept would stand only for the content of consciousness. And further, there would be no way to acquire new knowledge of an entity and relate it to one's concept, because the concept would now be a different one the file folder itself would have changed on such a viewpoint, and the upshot would be complete chaos. Similarly, on that viewpoint, no two people's concepts of the same entity would be the same if their knowledge varied. And therefore, all communication, all education, all cognitive division of labor would be impossible. Now, Ms. Rand elaborates this issue on pages 60 to 62 of the book. And I urge you to study these pages very carefully. We will be pursuing this point again further in subsequent lectures. For now, we've covered as much as we can tonight about the processes by which concepts are formed and defined. Now, we have yet to study many further ramifications, including some crucial implications of the process as far as the proper use of concepts in the pursuit of knowledge is concerned, and that is what we are going to look into next time. Thank you. Now, I have a number of questions from last time, but it should be possible to finish them and even take some from this evening. <clears throat> and first, I have several from last time on free will, and I have combined them with a few that were submitted this evening on free will, so there's a little nest of those right at the outset. Excerpting from a long question, 
does the fact of free will necessarily imply that that factor dominates every essential aspect of human beings? The answer is yes, given the nature of free will as objectivism conceives it. By free will, as we saw, we mean the power over the operation of your mind, your conceptual faculty, the choice to focus or not, to think or not which therefore controls and includes the power over your conclusions, your value judgments, and therefore your emotions, your actions, your character, and everything essential about you. Free will, therefore, as conceived by the objectivist view, does imply, uh, it's uh, in the wording of the question, dominance over every aspect of human beings. Now, of course, free will as such, no matter how a philosopher construes it, doesn't necessarily. There was the ancient philosopher Epicurus, for instance, who had a radically different view of free will, which we will even look at briefly in Lecture 6, according to which free will was simply causeless action. You walk down the street and your arm swerves for no reason and stabs somebody, and that's what he regarded as free will. Now, on that view, obviously, free will is completely dissociated from your character and so on. But free will, as conceived by objectivism, does. Now, the next question is from the same person, judging by the cards and the form of submission. Last week, you said that environment can affect the ease of cognition, but not the commitment to know. But won't a man's commitment to know be affected by the success he derives from the effort? If a child is raised in an environment where every attempt to understand meets failure, on what grounds could he maintain a commitment to know? I would answer this either at great length or briefly. I would take the second method. One, according to objectivism, the commitment to know, to focus, has to be an absolute. It cannot be conditional. You cannot say, I propose to focus and to try to know on certain terms which I am going to give reality. If I get the answer within the first hour, day, week, or month, OK. If not, that's too bad for reality. You cannot stamp your foot at reality. If consciousness has to be volitionally maintained, you cannot put conditions of that kind on. And there are many cases, for instance, in creative work, where you do not get any, quote, reinforcement or success from your effort for long stretches, where you sit there and your mind feels like it has turned to jelly. And no matter how hard you focus, you cannot write or you cannot express your point or you cannot solve the problem. And if your idea was, well, uh, my commitment to know depends on my success, you may as well not enter the field and give up altogether. Now, the fact is, if you do continue long enough, and that brings me to the second point, and assuming you're asking a rational question, you will always reach some kind of success, some kind of clarification, some kind of advance within a human time scale and understanding that you can't stamp your foot and say you want it now. But even if you don't answer the direct question you're asking, it's always possible to introduce some clarification, some further definition of the problem, some further aspect which you see to be connected. And in that sense, there's always some success if you have any idea what you're asking and it has any sense to it, and you have any idea of what method to follow. Now, the only case I could imagine where this would not apply, is apropos of the child raised in an environment where everything is, where he meets only failure, is if he had actually wicked or vicious parents of an almost unimaginable kind, where they deliberately try to construct his world in a nightmare, unintelligible fashion. Not just, you know, the normal run-of-the-mill contradictions that parents uh, indulge in, <laughs> but actual wicked attempts to make him think entities are dissolving and that the world is ungraspable. Now, I could conceive that if the pa parents are vicious and imaginative enough, 
uh, the child could be wrecked at the very outset before he could even develop the conceptual level. They could literally kill his mind before he could get started. Only I wouldn't say in such a case that he is conditioned, simply that he is destroyed. But once he reaches the stage where he can form concepts, and I've tried to make it very clear that if your mother or father happens to have tastes you don't approve of, that does not put you in this category. Uh, but if you understand what I'm saying, uh, this would not be applicable, uh, except in the case of some diabolical parent. Now, continuing, another question. How can one choose to focus since selecting between being in or out of focus implies that you are already in focus? Now, the central issue here is that awareness comes in degrees. This is relevant to many questions that were asked on this point. There are degrees of clarity degrees of integration, degrees of keeping the context. This is an illustration of the point that I made in the lecture, that conscious processes have intensity, and that the, con that the concept subsumes all the units regardless of the measurements. And focus also has measurements, so there's a nice tie-in of free will and measurements. In other words, your choice is not unconsciousness, simply zero fast asleep in a black dream where you're aware of nothing, that's a cell carnage, or, or uh, full focused awareness. Those are not the only two possibilities. Now, this question implies as though the choice to focus, the person is fast asleep, and out of that state of complete asleep, he suddenly leaps up and says, let's uh, think, uh, let, let's focus. Obviously, it wouldn't work that way. The choice to focus is the choice to pass from a lower level of consciousness, less clarity, less integration, more passivity, less purpose, to a higher, more active, more purposeful, more clear level. And conversely, the choice to evade is not the passage from perfect focus to coma. <laughs> it's going from a higher to a lower. Uh, level, reversing the direction. Now, this question, I may say, is explicitly discussed in the Objectivist Newsletter in the April 1964 issue, so I refer you there if you have any further problems about it. If man's primary choice is to focus his mind or not, must he not have to have conceptual knowledge of his mind and of its potential to be in full focus before he can make a choice. Now, if I get this, the answer is very simply. You can focus, and you can choose to focus far before you have the concept of focus. And if you couldn't, you're never going to reach such a concept. It's exactly parallel to our discussion this evening of the concept of thought. You have to think to reach the concept of thought, but you don't have to have the concept of thought to reach the concept of thought, or there would be a hopeless circle, and you could never reach it. All you have to do is think, and then after a number of instances, you abstract, omit measurements, and form the concept. And the same is true of focus. You have to focus to reach the concept focus, but not the reverse. You don't have to have the concept focus in order to focus. You seem to imply that one could be in focus, this is another question, without focusing on any particular thing. That sounds like a contentless consciousness. Could you elaborate? Well, I did not intend to imply that. Uh, certainly would withdraw any such implication. The only thing I could think that could possibly have led someone to draw that conclusion is that I distinguished being in focus from thinking in the sense of problem solving. In the latter sense, when you ask yourself a question and then you work to find the answer and then pursue another question, that is one kind of mental activity you can do in focus. But I said that being in focus was a wider term, which embraced any mental 
uh, state, including walking down the street was the example we gave, and not simply purposeful uh, uh, problem solving. So perhaps that distinction made the person think that walking down the street you were in focus without focusing on any particular thing. But of course, even there, you would be focusing on something, whether the sights of the street or uh, uh, the store windows, whatever it happens to be. Obviously, focus must have some object. Otherwise, it would be contentless, and that would be impossible. Now, this is the last one I'm going to do on this kind of confusion, but it, this is a question. It was asked tonight, so perhaps it wouldn't have been asked if they'd heard my answer. Is it really possible for a normal, awake person not to think? Can one literally blank out one's mind, that is, choose not to be conscious? Maybe something's wrong with me. I've tried, but I can't stop thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Rand says she'd like to meet him. <laughs> <laughs> now, this question is equivocating on what is meant by not being conscious. And this was covered explicitly in Ms. Rand's articles and in my lecture. When we say that a person chooses not to be conscious, we are talking about the conceptual level. We are saying he is not mobilizing his knowledge, his ideas, his conceptual awareness, but is disintegrating and is simply letting stray percepts, for instance, if he's out of focus, strike him without attempting to identify or grasp them. As long as you're awake, you are obviously conscious in the sense that animals are conscious. You receive sensations and percepts. That much you're given by nature, assuming your brain isn't damaged and you're not on drugs and you're awake. That kind of perceptual awareness you have until you go to sleep. But when we're talking about being conscious or non-conscious, we obviously mean it in the human sense, the conceptual level. Now, it is not true that you cannot stop thinking. All a person can mean is he can't, A, he can't go unconscious by an act of will. There's a certain transition to, com to become completely unconscious. You have to lie down and uh, you know, go through some process before you fall asleep, unless you suddenly have a coma strike you. But that is not the normal process. You can't just turn off the faculty as such. But you can certainly turn off the conceptual level of that faculty like that when you choose. Now, there are cases where you are so uh, um, excited about a subject. You are so uh, fascinated by it. It means so much to you. There, and there's no conceivable reason you can think of why you shouldn't focus on it. And it's going so well, and you're all involved, that you could say, in that moment, you can't get your mind off. That is possible. But that does not guarantee, even there, that your mind is going to follow a step-by-step -step logical process. Because even with all that excitement, your mind can freewheel in the wildest, bizarre ways, can jump all over the place. And uh, in any event, when you wake up as a daily proposition, you do not wake up that way. You have to put yourself into the state of that kind of focus. I don't mean that kind of emotionalism, but you have to generate that kind of focus, and you certainly can stop. And the evidence of this is that people do, <laughs> all the time. Well, that's all for free will this evening. Now, from last week. Does a man deserve, oh, this is in regard to, I'm just excerpting the question, but it's in regard to the issue that a man is responsible for every emotion he experiences. And the person asks, does this mean that a man deserves moral condemnation for emotions that are the result of wrong premises? Is he to despise himself for emotions which disclose wrong premises? The short answer is no. Now let's take this in steps. The first thing is, you have to be sure what an emotion means. The 
the fact that emotions come from premises does not mean that every emotion you feel in any context or under any circumstances is necessarily indicative of key or essential or fundamental premises that you actually hold. There are such things, for instance, as out-of-context emotions, which come from a temporary perspective on a situation which does not represent your actual convictions and which proves nothing, whatever, therefore, about a person. For instance, Galt, in the moment when he wished that he had the various existential situation that Reardon had, and then he what, came back to the right perspective, and he lost the desire. Now, for a moment, he saw the situation out of context. Now, if he followed the implicit methodology of this questioner, he'd have to say in that moment, well, you see, my strike doesn't really matter to me, and none of my values matter because I had this uh, transient uh, uh, perspective. Emotions are not tools of cognition. That's what you have to remember, our discussion of mysticism for last time, from last time. Emotions do not give you automatic knowledge, not even about the inner world, not even about the self, not even about your premises. If you want to find out something about yourself from um, your emotions, you must identify them by a proper methodology. In other words, by a reason. All right. Suppose you don't make that mistake. And let us suppose you have an enduring, persistent characteristic emotion, which does indicate an actual premise on your part, not some, uh, something on the order of what we just said, but an actual enduring premise, and suppose it's wrong. Well, should you ask, should you then condemn yourself morally in this case? And the answer is not necessarily. It entirely depends on, is it an error of knowledge, or is it a breach of morality, which is a topic we will be discussing in a later lecture. But briefly, if you take Reardon as an example of someone who felt guilt or self-reproach mistakenly, but certainly is not grounds for moral condemnation, because he made an honest error. He inadvertently accepted a view which uh, he did not uh, understand the full implications and meaning of. Now, to blame a person in such a case for his emotion would be to demand omniscience, to say no one can make a mistake. And you cannot demand the impossible, obviously. A moral error, on the other hand, I'm anticipating here, but a moral error, in essence, means reaching a conclusion by evasion reaching it dishonestly, not trying your best and being thrown off, but distorting your perception, refusing to look. Now, that you can condemn yourself for, and must, because that, according to objectivism, is the essence of immorality, and it's that which deserves moral condemnation. But that is a volitional process. The principle here is you condemn morally only that which is volitional, if assu assuming you've done it wrong. It is pointless to condemn the automatic results. The emotion in this case is simply the automatic result of the premise. The thing that you have to focus on in terms of moral condemnation is the evasion, if such it was, the evasion which led to it. it as absolutely meaningless to focus on the automatic emotional result and say how bad it is. You had no choice about the result in that respect. What your choice lay in the mental process which produced that result, and that is what you judge one way or the other. The other aspect, which is directly volitional and open to your moral appraisal, is what action you take in regard to your emotion. Suppose you have a bad emotion of envy or jealousy or hatred of someone which is unjustified, and you don't act on it. You try to identify what the cause is and so on and uproot it, but you deliberately say, I will not act on this. You are not subject to moral condemnation uh, because you're not acting on it. Morality applies to what is open to your choice, and action, as we'll see, is open to your choice. On the other hand, if you rush out in a frenzy of hostility and punch the guy in the face, then you are subject to moral condemnation. But then it's not 
the, the uh, inner antagonism or hatred, which is the root and the source, the object of the condemnation. It's the action that you willfully took on. So emotion as such is not the issue. You do not judge yourself by emotions. You don't condemn emotions. But we will be discussing that further when we get to morality. Now a couple of brief questions on um, introspection. <clears throat> All axioms are known only by direct sensory perception. And the existence of consciousness is one fundamental axiom. But are we aware of our consciousness by direct sensory experience? Obviously, no. You do not see, hear, etc., your consciousness. Your consciousness you are aware of by introspection, by looking in. So you can put it this way you are aware of your consciousness by observing yourself having sensory experience, if that helps. And another quick question on that. Is it self-evident that introspection is a valid means of knowledge? Presumably this question is prompted by the torrent of behaviorists uh, in colleges who denounce introspection as intrinsically invalid. The answer to the question is yes, it is self-evident that introspection is a valid means of knowledge. Now it doesn't mean that any time you introspect, you will necessarily identify in conceptual terms correctly, automatically. You must follow an appropriate methodology in introspecting as you must in extro extrospecting. Just as looking doesn't automatically tell you what you are looking at, you have to follow logic and assemble evidence. The same is true of introspection, as on the example of identifying an emotion. But if you feel a sensation of pain in your tooth, and you can feel that ache thrilling and throbbing in the root, and a behaviorist comes up and says, how do you know, that is possibly a case to punch him in the mouth. <laughs> in other words, what you are directly aware of, you are aware of. And you do not have to go into a song and dance about it. Now I have some bibliographical and miscellaneous practical questions, briefly, which I threw in the middle here. Other than the works of Ayn Rand, would you provide us with a list of books worth reading on the various areas we are covering in this course? I wouldn't take the time to do that because you have two easy means of answer to that question. One is to write the Palo Alto Book Service, which has a great number of them on, in stock, and I believe has a brochure of books that we specifically recommend on various topics. Not books, for the most part, by objectivists, but books which have valuable information um, uh, on the subject. Uh, the thing I would recommend as an alternative to that is read past issues of the Objectivist Newsletter on the Objectivist, where we commonly had a feature, a book review, which told you what uh, we thought of a certain book, what information it contained, and it was generally, uh, in fact, almost exclusively, as I recall, positive reviews, that is, of books that were worth uh, reading, that had something in them. So you can go to the back files and get that information. Now, another bibliographical question. After lecture two, you referred us to dictionaries for definitions. Can you rem recommend a good dictionary? Well. I'd answer that briefly by saying the older the better. <laughs> the test is look up some controversial philosophic term and see what kind of definition you are given. And if you see, for instance, under capitalism, the system of progressive impoverishment of the masses, <laughs> owing to the exploitation of ruthless tycoons, <laughs> I would not buy it. The older, the better. <laughs> now, I may say, I personally have found that the Oxford English Dictionary is a good dictionary and not slant. Now, I have not read all of their definitions, and no dictionary <laughs> 
It's I don't know how many volumes, 15 or something, but you can get a two-volume edition. Uh, no dictionary is going to give you the proper definition of philosophic terms. That I'll tell you right off the bat, if they're key philosophic terms, because the proper definition requires a proper philosophy. And since that doesn't exist among dictionary makers, the most you're going to get is an indication and a lead. But the Oxford uh, English Dictionary is the best I have encountered, and I frequently find it helpful. And one more practical question, which I must answer. Do you object to students making copies of their notes on the high points of your lectures for distribution or sale to friends? <laughs> yes. These lectures are copyrighted. They are for your private use, whatever notes you take. And the suggestion here is improper and, by my knowledge, illegal. Now, obviously, I don't care or object. If you occasionally show some point to a friend or a wife or whichever. But uh, the idea of an organized production and distribution that is my prerogative, and at some point it will be done, but not tomorrow. Now, back to questions. If metaphysics is equivalent to the bottom floors of the skyscraper of philosophy, on which all the other sections rest, and if metaphysics contains the axioms on which all the rest of man's actions depend, then why do you maintain that epistemology and not metaphysics is the most important section of philosophy? One, the two subjects are enormously interconnected. And regardless of what my brochure said, no one could actually state that the subject of my second lecture was metaphysics in contrast to epistemology. It was metaphysics, but it was just as much the base of epistemology. Epistemology, remember, is the theory of knowledge. How are you going to have knowledge without a reality, a consciousness, which is the faculty for knowing it, a law of identity to follow, etc.? So in that sense, the two subjects are extremely interconnected. Either implies the other, and uh, uh, you cannot say that uh, First we do metaphysics, that's the base, and then the next floor is epistemology. As soon as you open your mouth and say existence exists, you're up to your neck in both fields, and then it's a question of which direction you go. Now, you know, there used to be a big controversy in philosophy while philosophers were still engaged in discussing philosophic questions <laughs> as to which came first, and there were two schools, the pro-metaphysics and the pro-epistemology school. The pro-metaphysics school insisted that you had to start with metaphysics on the grounds that until you knew something about reality, how could you ever know what qualified as valid knowledge? And the pro-epistemology school said you have to start with epistemology because until you validate your means of knowledge, how will you ever know what is reality? Now, the objectivist answer to that problem is neither starts before the other. They start exactly at the same point with A as A. That is the basic fact of metaphysics, or existence exists, which sets the terms of epistemology. And epistemology is really working out the method of awareness which corresponds to existence. And in this sense, the two start together. And we don't, in that way, give primacy to one over the other. In what sense do we say epistemology is the most important? Only in the sense that there is much more to the subject of epistemology. It's a much more difficult and complex subject. And it is errors in the field of epistemology that have wrecked philosophy, including metaphysics. Above all, errors in the theory of concepts. Now, this one I have to answer briefly. <laughs> As written, it is, what's a Korzybski? <laughs> Now, this is presumably inspired by the fact that in my discussion of logic last time, I said that objectivism is committed to logic 100 percent and that we don't tolerate any antonym to logic, whether you reject it in the name of the heart or LSD or Korzybski. Now, 
just to clarify this, Korzybski is a man. <laughs> Count Alfred, and he is the founder of the School of General Semantics and the author of a book called The World of Non-A. I think that's the title, as I remember, in which uh, he presents what a non-Aristotelian, non-A as a view of the universe would be. I suppose by the fact that this question came in, it simply shows that the example that I gave was dated, that nobody's heard of Korzybski anymore. But 20 years ago, some lunatic fringe people had heard of him. <laughs> Where does it per this is another question. Where does a person's IQ fit in, fit in an epistemological context? Can two people with different IQs reach the same conceptual conclusions? Yes. Now let me say a few words about this issue. First of all, please distinguish IQ from intelligence. Intelligence being simply mental faculty or ability, the capacity to deal with broad abstractions. That's in essence what intelligence means, the capacity to deal with broad abstractions. IQ means intelligence quotient. And that pertains to the results of a specific test which purports to measure intelligence. Now, any of the tests which I have seen are enormously dubious. They have not devised a method of determining a person's ability to deal with abstractions, but uh, their questions include uh, how much content he actually knows and don't allow for that. And consequently, they do not test anything legitimately, none of the tests uh, that I know of. And you know that if you ask the makers of IQ tests, or the more theoretical among them, the less theoretical just churn out scores. But if you ask the more theoretical, what, do you, uh, uh, what is intelligence? Their answer is intelligence is, by definition, whatever it is that IQ tests measure. Well, how do they know what to measure? Who knows? That's uh, their answer. I once had a professor who said, matter is whatever physicists study. And I asked him, how do physicists know what to study? And he said, without batting an eye, they find out from other physicists. <laughs> so I said, well, what about the first physicist? And he said, there was no first physicist. So I said, well, was the second first? And he said, yes. <laughs> Now, this IQ, the idea that intelligence is what IQ tests measure, is the same thing, you see. Now, in regard to the issue of differences of intelligence, there is no convincing proof that I have seen as to whether differences of intelligence are innate in a function of the brain or acquired by a person's mental processes, habits, psychoepistemology, premises, etc. Uh, but I think this is an unimportant question without any real practical significance, because it's been estimated that people use an enormously small fraction of the intelligence that they have, and therefore uh, no one is in the position of, I'm straining my mind to the ability, but I just don't have it. If he doesn't have it, the questions wouldn't occur to him and it wouldn't bother him. Uh, as to the relevance to epistemology or to knowledge, there is no relevance of differences of intelligence at all. Because however, whatever degree of intelligence you have, you use the same method, you would come to the same conclusions. The only conceivable relevance would be that certain subjects, like the higher reaches of uh, nuclear physics, for instance, might be too complex for a person of very modest intelligence. He wouldn't come to different conclusions. He'd just stay out of that field. Uh, and here's one from last week on concepts. 
what are the units? He looked ahead, you see, or she, to this week. What are the units that are isolated and united to form the concept of time? Now, I'm not going to repeat my uh, analysis of time, which I gave you, I think, after the second lecture as the measurement of motion and in what way it's a relationship. So I'll just answer in a sentence. The units are the specific instances of temporal relationships. This is true more broadly of any concept of a relationship. The unit that you integrate are its instances. Time is a measurement of motion. Well, you observe that in various situations, and then you grasp that there is this type of relationship between one thing and the motion of another, regardless of the measurements of the motions. And you omit the measurements, and you get the idea of the measurement of motion, regardless of the particular amount, and that is time. Now, I have actually gone through the questions that I selected as of general interest from last time. So let's take some from this time that I put aside. And give me just a second to see what has accumulated here. I must correct this in a sentence. You state that an expanding context of knowledge invalidates definitions, not concepts. I did not say that. I went out of my way to state that expanding knowledge does not invalidate definitions, does not contradict the old definitions, does nothing whatever except, in certain cases, give you more entities to distinguish and therefore require you to change which characteristic you take as definitional. That does not invalidate. The old definition is 100% valid if it ever was in the context in which it was specified. Now you see the person goes on to cash in on this inexact formulation. Might not an expanding context therefore also invalidate previously valid concepts? You see why you have to be careful? Obviously, no. It doesn't do it in the case of definitions, and it doesn't do it in the case of concepts. And if you understood what I said about concepts, the concept is not altered at all across time. It represents the thing including all of its characteristics. And consequently, the issue of new knowledge is not relevant to altering the concept as distinct from the definition. Did you say all knowledge is based on former knowledge? No, I said all conceptual knowledge. The person goes on, how can this be if we all start tabula rasa? That's why I put the word conceptual in. But uh, obviously, at the beginning, you start from zero, from wherever your first awareness is. But that we're going to discuss the conceptual, uh, the contextual nature of knowledge uh, next time. Why do you say that a definition must be formed in the context of all the knowledge available to man, as opposed to the knowledge of the person forming and using the definition? <laughs> well, because I assume he's a man, <laughs> and that he wants to acquire a definition within the framework of the knowledge available to him. Now, here you have to be careful. If he's a child, obviously, by the very example that I gave, it would be ridiculous to say he has to go to uh, uh, university and take 15 courses on the humanities, all of which study man, before he can appropriately reach a definition. He has to go, since he's a, a, a young, developing consciousness, with the similarities and differences that are accessible to him. Why do I say it's available to man? Because I'm speaking when we reach the stage of adulthood. And at that point, you are then, presumably, in contact with, if you're not in a desert island, the knowledge that is available to the human race. And as such, you must make a contact with that knowledge and make use of it. Now, the only point that perhaps should be made here is this. There is a distinction between specialized scientific knowledge and general or essential philosophic knowledge. And that distinction can apply to definitions also. For instance, if you are, are forming a definition of man, we use the genus 
animal. Now that is a proper genus, even though if you go into biology, you will find all sorts of more specialized, technical genera that you can give, like primates and mammals and etc. But you do not have to, it would even be inappropriate to include those as part of the definition, if you're speaking of a general definition of man, to capture the essence for purposes of general knowledge. In that sense, it's the knowledge available to you as an adult, open to grasp with what knowledge is known within the context of what's available to you. And there's no inconsistency in there being a definition, for instance, of man as rational animal, and at the same time, a scientist in biology having a much more specialized genus. So it does not mean that the full context does not mean that you have to go out and study everything known in every case. <sighs> Since insane men are still considered men, would you modify the definition of man to read a potentially rational animal? Sure. No, because I do not expect statements to be taken out of context. When man is defined as rational animal, there was absolutely no uh, meaning in that, that he always actually is rational. It means that he has the faculty or the capacity. Nor is that definition invalidated if he loses his mind. Or uh, if you want to add in all the rest, uh, has the lobotomy and etc. and so on. When you define an entity, you have to remember that the concept stands for the entity, including all the facts about the entity. And one of the facts about a living entity is that it can undergo damage. It can be hurt. It can even have damaged or lose its means of survival. The concept has to recognize that fact. And when it defines that an entity by a certain attribute, it has to take into account and remember that possibility always exists of damage or the loss of this attribute. That does not mean the concept is not applicable when the attribute is lost. The actual proper description is a damaged whatever, man or whichever. I mean, it's not that when he goes insane, he becomes an ice cream sundae or a banana. <laughs> he is still a human being. Now, this is, you see, is a linguistic uh, type question. You said rational, and he can't reason, and therefore dropping the whole context of how that definition is reached and what it presupposes. Now, let me see. What is the epistemological status of the objectivist theory of concepts? I had this in the lecture and cut it for space. <clears throat> is it axiomatic? Is it self-evident? Have you proved it? Or is it a base for proof, or what? That's a perfectly legit legitimate question. And the answer is, briefly, the objectivist theory of concepts is reached and validated by induction. It is not self-evident in the sense of a primary axiom. It is not reached by deduction from some principle. It is reached by observation including, of course, introspection, observation of one's mental processes, and then generalization from uh, what one observes. Uh, what Ms. Rand had to do to reach this is to range across all the various categories of concepts that are known and observe what her mind did in the process. And when she did, she simply observed this was the characteristic that was in common in all the cases of forming concepts. And that's one of the reasons why. It is not enough when you reach a theory of concepts to do it as traditionally philosophers did only on one type, like, for instance, physical entities. A theory of concepts has to subsume every kind of concept. Therefore, it has to apply to concepts of entities, of actions, of relations, and so on, of a higher level concepts, of concepts of consciousness, 
and that means the mind has to make a series of observations about what it is doing and then grasp the principle. That is induction. And induction, by the way, is the method by which crucial knowledge is arrived at. Deduction is like the technology of knowledge, the application. But the real fundamental principles are arrived at by induction, and the theory of measurement omission is one. Now, of course, someone here is sure to think, so I'll follow this up for one moment. Well, but how do you know then? If all you've got to go on is the observation of reality, how do you know that you will not discover a concept someday that won't fit the pattern of the measurement omission? Now, the answer to that is very simple. First, the principle of the onus of proof, which we will be discussing in Lecture 6. The onus of proof is on he who asserts the positive. Now, if somebody says there is such a concept, let him tell us what it is. Until such time, we cannot consider arbitrary possibilities. More on that in Lecture 6. But if someone does come up and say, I go through a different mental process, I don't omit measurements, then it's up to him to tell us, what do you do? And we'll find one or the other of two things. I mean, even in theory, in giving this the benefit of the doubt, Either he has uh, some new form of cognition. So we've learned something. He is some other species, and he has some other method of acquiring knowledge. If he can communicate it to us, that's very interesting. Or he's made a mistake, and he is wrong. And we simply point that out. In either case, this is the issue of the contextual theory of knowledge. No knowledge based on observation of reality and arrived at by a correct method is ever threatened by future discoveries. And that applies to inductive knowledge as much as any other. But there again, uh, I think that we get to in Lecture 6. Now, um, how does genus <coughs> in a definition apply to primaries? What larger group do they belong to, such as the universe or existence? Now, by primaries in this context, there are many contexts there, but if you mean by existence, you cannot give a definition of existence at all uh, in the sense of genus and differentia. You obviously couldn't say existence belongs to a broader category. What would it possibly be? This is the broadest concept that there is, which includes everything. Existence is not a type of uh, green cheese or something. It's everything. And consequently, obviously, there can be no genus or differentia for a concept such as existence. It is an axiomatic, philosophic primary. And in that respect, it can only be defined ostensibly. You simply sweep your hand and say, existence is that. This does not mean, however, that anything which is called a primary is necessarily outside the possibility of a genus. For instance, there's a certain context in which sensations are primaries, like blue, green, etc. And all you can do is point to them. If you ask me, what do I mean by blue, I have to ultimately point to a sensation. I can give a definition in terms of light waves, but I mean the actual experience of the color blue, you have to point. It's ostensive. That's true of all sensations. In that sense, they're definitional primaries. But it's still possible to give a genus for them. You can say blue is a sensation or color attribute, etc. So uh, you have to be careful what you mean by primaries. But in the sense of philosophic primaries, well, even there, consciousness is a faculty possessed by human beings. That's the genus. So it, uh, you can't automatically assume that a primary is outside definition. If you read Ms. Rand's chapter on definition, you'll see that there are two kinds that have to be defined ostensibly and that you can't give full genus and de differential definitions. That is, conceptualized sensations and uh, philosophic axioms. But you read the chapter. Do I think there's any validity to the notion of visual thinking, thinking in images rather than words? No, I do not for the reasons that I gave during the lecture. Um, and here is the last one. And that timing is just going to come out right. Now, this one I could answer at great length or in a 
sentence, and I will really, truly refer myself, uh, restrict myself to a sentence, is the relationship between mathematics and concept formation, as formed by Miss Rand, similar to Bertrand Russell's attempt to establish a mathematical relationship to logic? If so, how valid is the study of symbolic logic? The answer to those two questions are no and none. <laughs> Ms. Rand's use of mathematics and its connection to concept formation is not only not similar to Bertrand Russell's use of mathematics, it is the antithesis, the literal diametric opposite. Now, of course, which Russell you talk about depends upon which particular book you read, because he went through the incarnation of every corrupt philosophic position <laughs> in his lifetime. But in essence, he was animated by one consistent goal, and that was to sever mathematics, concepts, and concepts, consciousness, and cognition from reality whether to tie mathematics to a platonic dimension, as he did in some phases, or to construe it in a positivist fashion as arbitrary semantics, as he did in others, or to weld both in his inimitable style of getting the worst of every viewpoint. <laughs> now, this is the opposite of the objectivist viewpoint. The whole idea of Miss Rand's view is that if you grasp the nature of mathematics, and the nature of concept formation, that will enable you to see that concepts are based on reality, that they are not an issue of whim, that you have no choice, that there are no alternative logics or multi-valued logics or what is called symbolic logic, which consists of starting with arbitrary assumptions in accordance with arbitrary rules to derive preposterous conclusions to give unjustified professors unearned income. <laughs> In other words, we reject what is called symbolic logic out of hand and Bertrand Russell above all. Uh, that's a brief indication, and uh, we will continue the discussion of concepts next week.